I'm talking, everybody needs to hear this. This is Crush It 2008. It, I was right, it's real. Like, people are still not doing it. You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy, don't you wanna be happy? Hey guys, it's Gary Vaynerchuk. Super excited uh, about being back on the podcast. Really, uh, really um, just hopeful everybody's doing super well and let's just really get right into this conversation with Sam. Uh, I'm gonna let him introduce uh, himself and then I will take it away. Sam, why don't you tell the Vayner Nation who you are, what you're about, and then we'll go into it. Yeah, uh, I'm Sam Parr. I own this company called The Hustle. Um, So we started out with conferences and things like that and I could talk about that, but um, yeah, we had this conference called HustleCon after I sold one company. I started this thing called HustleCon. Um, it's basically like a TED Talk for entrepreneurs, but I made it popular by creating an email newsletter. And then I was like, this email newsletter thing's awesome. So kind of parlayed it into the hustle. And so now we're a daily email with um, about one and a half million daily readers um, and bootstrapped a media company. Uh, each morning we give, uh, like I said, about a million and a half people all the business news and information they need to know. And then we've parlayed that into a bunch of other things like a paid subscription called Trends, um, podcasts, and a bunch of other things like that. So how about as a kid, like, were you entrepreneurial? Yeah, so I um, grew up in Missouri and then I went to college uh, in Tennessee. And when I was in Tennessee, I owned a chain of hot dog stands called Southern Sam's, wieners as big as a baby's arm. And (laughs) (laughs) and like- How old were you? uh, I started when I was like 20, but before that I was selling stuff on eBay. Uh, But like that was my first legal business where I got business license and paid taxes and things like that. Uh, have you seen a TV show called American Pickers? Yes. So Mike, the main guy, the skinny guy, I met him on the street because I was a big fan and I asked him to work at his company or at his store. He was opening up a store where they sell like all the old shit. Um, and I worked there and it was great, but there was always a line of like a thousand people and I was like, I'm gonna go open up a hot dog stand and sell hot dogs to these people. And that's what happened. Because the show was so famous that people- Yeah, would- when I worked there in 2000 and- 11 or no sorry 2008 or 9 or something like that we were number two on cable behind Pawn Stars and uh, all these people from around the world would come and get in this line where was that it was in Nashville and it, but it was he like he's into old stuff right so he got this old building that was away from everything and there was no restaurants and I was like huh these kind of, it's, I'm from the south so I can say this but they're kind of rednecks who would come and, and, and wait in line and I was like these fuckers want some hot dogs and water that's all they want and I opened up this hot dog stand and that was like my first hustle. Yeah, first business Official. that made money and I'd pay taxes and got licenses. And, and how did that go? How long did you do it? For a few years, I mean, you would make a grand a day on a good day. Yeah, it was awesome. And then um, I started a website that made a little bit of money, but I was like, oh, the internet's the way to go. And so I left school and moved out to Silicon Valley, <clears throat> San Francisco, and uh, originally had job offers at Airbnb, but at the time it was called Airbed and Breakfast. But I was like, you know, screw this, let's try to start something. So I started a roommate matching app that had a small exit and then kind of parlayed that into the hustle and what I'm doing now. Um, and what was that company called and who did it sell to? It was called Bunk originally, Bunk SF. It was, so what we would do is, <laughs> it was kind of funny, we would cold email all these landlords and apartments of, who had two, three, four, five bedroom apartments and then we would host parties so people who had similar wants and needs for living situation could all meet one another and we would help them move into these buildings and we would take a small cut of like a placement fee. Mm-hmm. And so it was a small exit, like hundreds of thousands of dollars to apartment list, so apartmentlist.com. And did you have to work in that company or no? Yeah, and I quit on the f- first day you did, she could. or whatever it was, yeah, like that last day. How was that, How you know, as, as somebody who now it sounds like your whole career has been for yourself, how was that year working so It was else? good, like I still don't know shit, like, I had to read books on like how to run a meeting. So I, I felt like, I, I moved to San Francisco from Tennessee, I, and I grew up in Missouri. I always felt really uncomfortable and out of place there, but I love it now. I didn't know anything. Like I would say things that were inappropriate. I would wear stuff I wasn't supposed to wear. I just felt horrible. So it was good to see like what an actual business is run like. Um, but I was also young, I was 22 and I was partying and I didn't take it as seriously as I should have and I, I regret that big time. But it was great to see. What was the biggest take? What would you argue the one or two or three biggest takeaways were from that year? Even though you were just partying, like leveling like- up. Like okay, so you guys have a great setup here. Okay. Um, you started in like a small room, I imagine. Yes. Just like a shitty office. That's right. And so just seeing like, wait, I could take all these little silly things like a hot dog stand or whatever, and like properly build it out with nice offices after you get revenue and like 
Like I need you in order to get huge as big as my ambitions where you really need to properly approach things and be able to like have a go up proper levels as opposed to Have you started to challenge proper? So like for example, what was funny running through my mind in uh, when you just said, you know, I read books on how to run a meeting properly. I was right. like laughing in my head because I was like, fuck man, I probably hate that book. Right? Because like to me like meetings and like how the world those proper things you're referring to, see meetings, and how I personally see meetings, there's a huge delta, and I'm curious, how old are you now? Uh, I just, I'm 30. I'm curious, you know, uh, someone who also came from out of bounds and never understood proper, I always wonder, I'm always challenging myself of like, what was I naturally gifted in, in an entrepreneurial and human way what has evolved over these 22 years of operating and what have I taken on that is horse shit because it's osmosis of yeah, the right no, way? Yeah, I feel you, but in my, here, in my mind it's like this. Okay, when you play an instrument, when you learn the guitar, you don't, it's, it, most people don't play songs of their own songs right away. Right. They kind of copy other people and feel the texture and they go, yep. oh, I see some kind of like, the, the stuff that I like, I see yep. recurring patterns. Yep. This is interesting, I can, I can disregard yep. this other stuff. So what I do is I, I'll, I'll usually read books. I I'll, get it. I'll read like, I'll read your guys' glass doors. I'll I get read it. other companies' glass doors. I'm like, all right, what do people say? What yep. people, like, what's the baseline for like what is interesting? And I can you can cherry pick. But like, if, if you don't know like anything, you, you ha it's easier to have like a model, and then you can know what to disregard. Yeah, but I would argue that your analogy for the way you went about it, unless I'm missing something, is actually not flawed, but not exactly the same analogy because it sounds like based on your hot dog business, what you're telling me is you didn't play other people's music, you picked it up, started playing something, and within that micro area, it worked. Yes, I, would it, also, I would also argue that, you know, it's really interesting where the source of information comes from, right? So there's a lot of business books being written by people who've never run a business. Well, I usually read biographies. Fair enough. Glassdoor is just anonymous reviews. Yeah, and so it always usually goes very one, dirty data. It goes one far end or one other end. That's what I mean. I mean, you're at this young age where you've had these levels of successes. You know, I have such empathy for where you're coming from because I'm sure I had a lot of those same feelings of like, I'm from out of bounds. I don't go to business school and things of that nature. And I remember, ironically, it's interesting for you to bring that up. I also remember kind of hitting the Silicon Valley scene and like every single person went to Stanford and Harvard. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. And I, and I was like, thank God for me, very different for you, that I already had such a real significant win that I was able to kind of use that. But I have so much empathy for what must have been going through your mind in that scenario. On the flip side, you're catching me at a very funny time where I would, what are we, February 24th? These eight weeks are probably the, my favorite eight weeks of being an operator in a long time because I decided going into this year that I was gonna go more me because I've really let the company do its thing. I'm running the company, but I've let the osmosis of like classic executives have a lot of say over the last half decade. And I would argue that the last eight weeks have been some of those productive weeks at VaynerMedia's history and definitely my favorite time in the last four years because I'm going back a little bit to hot dog with the baby arm shit. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, we agree. I think that, but it's still important, it was important for me to understand how. Right, because you needed that context. Yeah, I get it, I get it. So like, for I was, like my hot dog thing, I'd be like, all right, I'm just gonna pay, take this thousand dollars in cash, I'm gonna put that shit right in my pocket, right? Like. The, I'm not even going to incriminate myself, but you know what I mean. You're going to um, go spend it on some dumb shit. Well, I didn't spend it on that. Many. No, no, no. I just, oh, you got it. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just didn't do things the right. Didn't do yeah. proper accounting things like I get that. It. Now that we have an eight figure, you know, we make seven figures a month. It's a good. I think it can be a, a, a very large company. Just learning how to do shit totally properly. Now, not 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 everything needs to be proper. No, like, no. To, to the outside world, but like. There are some things where like, all right, I gotta make sure I do things the right way. 100%. Um, you know, when and, things go from just And have you around. brought in people? Like is yeah. that how? Adam is our president, uh, which who I knew from high school. Um, he kind of, he's, he's the president, runs a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. He's a straight man. Yeah, yeah, and so I'm able to like, I'm able to kind of be my wild self and then we'll, we don't always meet in the middle. Sometimes I, I will st will still go the wild route, but like there, I have some proper procedures. Dude, for a while I was doing the accounting. And, Not good. And I was like, I thought cash flow and revenue were the same thing. I'd be like, guys, we got to get these people to put the money in our bank. That's not revenue. I'm not paying your quota on that. And I get it. And then you, you learn all that right stuff. You know how the, the right way to do it. That's what I'm referring to. I totally understand. Um, you know how it is. Like not coming from this 
area, it's really uncomfortable at first, but it's actually a, a uh, advantage in the end, I think. A hundred thousand percent. Um, I used to have this book club called the Anti-MBA because when I moved to San, San Francisco, I was so jealous of all these Stanford people. So I would create this book club and we'd meet once a week and then we'd get experts to come in and lead the discussion. And I was like, look, we just did the same thing as, as Stanford. Uh, of course. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's really uncomfortable, I think, and you know how it is. What are you thinking about going forward? Like, where's your mindset on on like the next half decade, decade, next year? Like, what's as an operator, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, what's exciting you right now? Um, our business is doing well. I want to. I mean, I, I don't necessarily care about money, but I'm a I'm a runner, an old run, uh, I ran in college, and so I love having goals. I want to hit 100 million in revenue by 2025, and I'm really excited. I think there's a lot of media brands out there who operate horribly and aren't doing the right things. I think we can build a massive B2B publishing explain, explain business. Explain to me on that. Like, what are your some hot? What are your hot takes on the? I think the New York media spe- scene is horrible. Because I, um, I think that they look at. Google Analytics more than they actually talk to users and talk to customers and figure out like what people want and they create shit they love. They don't treat them like customers. It's just Google Analytics. It's like, oh, if we just change this headline to this, that's gonna do. It's like, well, what's that? What does that really mean? And what you're seeing now is that's actually impacting people in, uh, in the long run. This is why Barstool Sports sold for with their stock just went up by fifty percent. Their sale price was effectively now like six hundred fifty million dollars, right? And Dave doesn't know shit. I bet at first about analytics. Um, he was an entrepreneur. He just made stuff that people loved, whereas a lot of the big companies, what are now big, they don't do that as much, and I think that that's gonna, a huge weakness for them and will help us. So non-consumer centric, quant centric. Yeah, Math. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Which, like, you need, you can have a little bit of that, but Agreed. not, they're gonna, come, like, Vice, what are they What are they valued at? Like two or three billion dollars? Yeah, I mean, I think when you talk about Vice, you have to talk about the narrative. I mean, one of the variables in this whole game is, you know, I don't know the story, so I, I can't speak to it, but my perception from the outside is some of the founders and investors in Vice did extremely well because... Yeah, I saw St. Schmidt, Smith sitting front row of that Tyson Fury fight. Yeah, I mean, you know, th- that becomes, that's a very big part of VC-backed businesses over the last half decade. That will be the legacy of this 10-year window, which is what was the delta between building long-term businesses, you know, how much leverage did founders have to be able to take money off the table at Series B and Series C levels? Was that what they were actually going for? You know, I, you know, Shane had, an, you know, again, just not knowing a lot about Vice, but one thing I definitely knew because I was in the circles of medium brands, Shane had a remarkable ability to sell. So good. You know, big brands, big, you know, big budgets. So, you know, there's so many, I, I'm with you, like so, so many So like, here's the difference. Let's say, let's say Vice posts something like on, on their social channel that says, our top reporter's gonna be here tomorrow, show up. Now let's say Gary posts, I'm gonna be here tomorrow, show up. Who does, who's gonna have the most pull? Of course. Right? Yeah, it, it, they have a billion dollars or eight hundred million dollars in funding or something like that. Yep, that to me is did is you, my point. Have are you self funded for this business? We took a little bit of angel money, so yep. I had self funded it. We made mm-hmm. I made my, the first couple conferences. I made five hundred grand in profit, and I piled all that money into mm-hmm. this. Then we took um, a small checks from Tim Ferriss, mm-hmm. the founders of Nerd Wallet, the founders of Bleacher Report. Um, People like that, like a very small. People that you thought could bring value. Yeah, because I was like emailing Smart these money. people and yeah. I would ask them questions and they're like, can I invest? I'm like, wait, you're going to give me money and I can just text you questions whenever I want. So we did a little bit of that. Smart. But no venture capital. What's the uh, What's the best piece of advice you've gotten from either smart money or outside people or you consumed somewhere in the last, let's call it the last year. What's, what's, what's some personal advice? Please. Joe Spicer, who started littlethings.com, which eventually went out, but he's very successful. Um, he was like, I'm gonna write you this check, but just know I just bought a big house in the Hamptons. It's not gonna make you happy. Yeah. And so like he gave me that right when he gave, it, gave us the money. Yep. Um, what are some other good advice? Um, um, Tim Ferriss has been really helpful. I mean, awesome. he's like anal retentive about his brand and about everything like that. Yeah, and I, super I, I think there's a little middle ground there, but like just seeing like how strict he is with his brand and it totally works for him and it has made him so much money him it's so good and i i really respect that um um where are you at this point in your life between money legacy the process if i said if i said 30 year old you right now between genuinely in your stomach in your heart in your gut about how much you're driven by and how much you like the net win is around dollars is around 
being able to do your process and around legacy, how, how are you currently broken down between 100% on those three? Well, I don't have children yet, so maybe things will change, but I have enough that I don't have to worry for maybe forever. Um, I find my, I thought I was really money motivated, but when you get all these like opportunities, when you get to a little bit of a level, like we'll pay you 10 grand to come here and do this or whatever. And I just, and I, and I found myself not wanting to do that. Cause I don't, I'm like, Oh, that sounds so boring to me. I don't want to do that. So I guess that answers the question of where I am a little bit. Um, I would, I mean, like one time we had, um, a client do something that we thought was an asshole thing and we fired them and we lost a quarter of a million dollars. And I slept like a baby. So I don't think I'm as money motivated, money motivated as I thought. Um, do you think that's because you checked some sort of box for yourself along the way versus 20-year-old no, you? No, here's what I say. I think I had fuck you money when I had 10 grand. Yeah, I get that. You I understand. Yeah, I do know that. <laughs> like, And then once I was like, wait a minute. I still don't think I've ever been more rich than when I was doing baseball card shows at 13. Because $3,000, $4,000 when you're 13 and you came from nothing, I thought I had like a trillion. I remember when I, one day I sold hot dogs and I had a grip of cash. It was like a grand. A grip. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, just a grip. It was like we call it. I call it a grip. Let me get that grip. And it was it was because I had like a jar here or tips, <laughs> and, I, and I had like a grand in five dollar bills, and I was like, "This is fucking money. It. This is it." I was I was like, I, we called it hood rich. And where did you grow up again? In St. Louis, Missouri, but then I lived in Nashville, Tennessee. But I grew up with a lot of like poor people, and you know that's why I talk like this. Uh, um, but I felt Did you re- like it? Did you think about it? I was you- happy. So in Nashville, I lived in, uh, across the street from the projects, and we would hang out all the time. I would and how old were you then? 19 to 21, 18 okay. to 21. And I would just ho- hang out there with my buddy Rydell, and we would just chill and just sit on. That was the most, it was, I, that was my happiest when I had nothing, um, which is weird, right? No, I think, um, it's, I think it's not weird at all. But. Uh, and what you guys talk about? Just shoot, like guy talk, girls, sports, just random shit? Or would you talk about dreams? Business, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, he, this dude, um, had served twenty five years in prison, and mm-hmm. he we would, we would talk about that, but just stupid stuff. But it was just, it's really fun. I, I think that when you come from not a lot, which you know, I had a good family and everything, but when you start from, when you're trying to start on your own from scratch, you're actually, and do you have siblings? Yeah, yeah, I have siblings, older brother and older sister. You were the youngest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think when you start from not a lot, it kind of, it's actually a huge advantage, and you could be a lot happier. That way, um, I think if I think if you're born into a wealthy family, the likelihood of like depression might actually be higher. I think so. You know what I mean? Based on our societal norms right now, yeah. so much of my passion about like what I talk about and the content I put out is to create empathy for. It's very hard. I, you know, I get it. I grew up in it. It's very hard for somebody that doesn't have much to have empathy for somebody who's driving a BMW and has a Rolex. But you know, based on all my readings. All my DMs, I get, at this point in my life, I have so hundreds of thousands of interactions per month, year, whatever it is. It's just a lot of interactions. I see far more sadness in people that had too much than in people who had too little. I see envy in people that don't have as much. I see drive in people that don't have as much. I see resentment in people that don't have as much. I see deep lostness in people that had too much, you know? like. There's just, uh, when people didn't have as much, they, there is an inherent, I'm gonna pull myself out of this. Whether it's illegal, legal, there's a drive. It's really hard to be hungry when you started fed. It just is. No, and I agree. And um, I, have, I have wealthy kids and I think about it constantly. So can, let me ask you a question Please. that I, I bet a lot of people wonder, or maybe a fair bit. So you started this from nothing. Yep. I started my business from nothing. I saw early on, even once we got to like 25, 30 employees, once it got to like 10 million in revenue, I was like, I don't want to operate, or I don't want to like be the guy of this business. I want to just go start from the bottom again and start stuff within the company. That's what I prefer. Yep. You seem like you would prefer that, but you seem like you're still like the guy in charge. I do both. The reason I have Team Gary is it is my little pirate ship. How many people work there? Team Gary? Yeah. 30 or so, right, feels right. So I have, my, I have my little, I have Gary V, my team Gary, uh, my K-Swiss collaboration, my Empathy is Wine. Is that a separate entity? K-Swiss? No, you're team Gary. No, it is part of So Vayner. how do you allocate budget to that? Uh, we use it as, we allocate it because I have full control and we look at it as a, 
as two things. One, the testing ground for hypotheses that become the scalable strategies and talent grooming and top of the funnel business awareness. We don't have to do RFPs because I'm Gary Vee. Gary Vee happened because of Team Gary. So it, instead of most companies that I compete with at the level that we compete at, who have enormous allocations to new business teams and spend tons of money on RFPs, we do none of that. And it amortizes out into the content engine which becomes far more strategic than spending $50,000 on a sizzle reel to try to get McDonald's to hire you. So do you I just like, walk in and say, hire us, dick. <laughs> do you like running an 800 person company? Yes, I'm an oper. You know, one thing with me that is interesting, and I would argue that it is potentially a weakness because I have so much magic. Back to you know, kind of where you're going with this. Ironically, I also had a ton of operational capability. I've basically been the COO, the operating decision maker, for my companies my whole life. I mean, AJ played that role, but he was by nature having an 11 year younger brother. He was so capable, so it was great. But I also there was a lot of uh, operational conversations we had together and so I am capable to operate and I often debate with myself, fuck, you know, even though I love it, I love it. Th- ultimately, I operate because I actually like operating. Um, because I have a real interesting distinction between the sizzle and the steak that both sit within me that is me. Who's your number two or number three, number four? Who's like your... So at Vayner, really, my, at Vayner Media, my number two is really, I mean, it's really an interesting mix. Like a CFO? Right? Yes and no, right? Because I'm not CFO driven. You know, and listening to your stories, I get where you're coming from. Um, like, and I have a lot of that too. Like, I'm far better at literally doing something nobody else can do than balancing checkbooks. Like, it's just boring as fuck to me. Back to cash flow and EBITDA. I went through all those same things. I'm like, fuck this, you know, like. Um, but what I will tell you is, my number two is a collective, I would argue, between Claude, Claude I always think of Claude as my number two because she's the chief heart officer, which is really HR, which I really believe is the punchline. No matter how- She creates like the hiring roadmap. Yeah, but she's also gray. She's not, she even has a number two in Jen Ruza. Like she herself is kind of like more you and me than she is a straight person. But I think that's exactly right for HR. HR is a function of humanity. Same way you cynically, properly by the way, cynically look at all the Google Analytics media companies. That's how I think about HR. I don't give a fuck about fucking hiring structure. I care about humanity. I don't care about fucking all the stuff we're supposed to do for the states that we're in, though we have to do that so we don't get sued and become liable. But what I care about is Claude knowing what fucking is on. I sat down with Seth. He, I'm looking right at him right now. I had four, I had something cancel. I see Seth on the fucking floor. And I literally was like, Seth, come into my office. And we have a 10 minute talk about Seth's life. This is real life. This happened a week ago. Right, Seth? Like, that's what I'm about, right? And I, I, I don't wanna speak for Seth, it's probably hard for me to ask you within being in the room, but I have a funny feeling Seth's relationship with VaynerMedia is better today than it was a week and a half ago because we got to have that talk, clarity and roadmap. That's how you build a big, your, your game is not gonna be, like at real scale, when I hear the level of ambition of 100 million by 2025, one, I personally get scared about that. I like people who, first of all, you know yourself. I'm not a runner, thus it makes sense to me, but I'm always inherently always nervous because I'm like, don't put that extra pressure on you. You know, like, but to your point, you know how to motivate yourself, you do you. Number two, my belief is no matter how remarkable the two of you are on kind of like the, the sizzle and the steak, that the th- most important variable to get to a hundo is HR. Okay, so you have your HR person report Which to you. both of you might be remarkable at, I just don't know. He's very good at it. I'm I believe you. Recruiting. Understood, um, makes so, sense. So you have- Hunting, farming. Yeah, so you have um, Claude. Claude, then Mark Yudkid, our general counsel, far outseeds that title. He's far more of a COO. He's been here from basically day one. He was my personal lawyer when I invested in Twitter and Facebook, and he's like, this kid must be right, and I recruited him, and we had a general counsel long before I thought it was appropriate, but I just knew he was right, and I was like, fuck it, I'll get there eventually and good because he's been a consigliere or whatever the fuck you call those things and a, and a general counsel and, and is evolving more and more into COO life. Marcus Krasastik, who's my, my brother's best friend since first grade, started here, should have never worked at Vayner but the economy collapsed. He was a super bright kid and had like nothing but finance offers but like he's an EQ kid it turns out and was smart enough to come here and just intern and he's my chief of staff. He's 
a quote unquote number two. I would argue, that, and, and Alan would agree with me, Alan probably falls more into a number three as a CFO. I'm just, basically I'm on the hyperbole, not hyperbole, I'm in the real life of pay the bills, invest. Pay the bills, invest. It's all in perpetuity, so I'm not looking to extract too many dollars out of the business at this point in my life, because I can afford to, and so I want to build a machine. That, um, that, you know, my admin team, Alex, Lou, Max, my admin team is a real factor in my life. Back to the joke we made before here, like, for everybody who's listening, I sat down, I was like, all right, excited to be on your podcast. He looked at me, he's like, motherfucker, I'm on yours. I'm like, oh shit. Like, that's how I am. We'll publish an article. You know? I'm you sure you it. will, but, I, but I, don't, I don't need you to. I, I, but it was a great insight for you of like, how high level I'm really playing it. Because it really ultimately doesn't matter. Like the context I needed for here, as you can see in the way I'm in, I know enough. I know enough from afar. I know enough of like right. I know how to bring the most value to you and to my audience. So like I like I don't spend time on things that I don't need to spend time on. So we have um, we have this thing we launched trends. It's pretty cool where yep. we where we do. Uh, uh, we basically uncover interesting opportunities, so it makes a, a ton of sense. Yeah, so it, it, it's a paid. It basically, it's like a, a I've pay, seen the I've seen the model my whole life. It's a paid newsletter with a group and community, and we're going to scale up like Political Pro, whatever. Um, and the point with trends right now is we're uncovering cool opportunities. So we'll do like a case study on a cool company. Like right now, I'm writing one just on the hotel industry. I think there's a lot of opportunities in hotels, and we'll kind of break down the financials. I love that. Or we'll. Um, we have technology that crawls the web and find things that are fast growing. Like, for example, people are, are searching for ways to sleep better more than they're searching for meditation stuff. I'm aware. And so we just will uncover that and talk about what it means and it's who's cool. exploiting that opportunity. And one of the things that we talk about on that and on our podcast is just like the real, like the economics of different things, uh, of different businesses and how they operate. Uh, how many employees do you guys have? We have almost 900. Okay, shit. So what I'm curious about, and I think a lot of people might be, is when, so we took, I made about $400,000, $500,000 in profits from the conference. That's what I used to fund our advertising business. Now those made a lot of profits, which fund, uh, fund this thing and that thing. And so that's our funding route. How were you guys able to scale to 800 people? Did you have any, did you get a, a line of credit? No, we, we got a free conference room the size of this. So that was our first overhead. Me and AJ didn't take any salary. AJ needed to, AJ saved money from eBay in high school and college. I had, I was in an interesting spot. I didn't own Wine Library. The part of my narrative a lot of people don't realize is in family businesses, you don't pay, like almost every employee made as much if not more than me. So I was, you know, my, my, in my 20s I was making 42, 57, 63. So the last couple of years I got up to a, a little around 100 but I lived in New York and right before Vayner started, I took all my liquid and invested in Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Can you reveal, reveal how much? Yeah, like two, how much did I put in? Like 220, 47, and 71. So somewhere in the ballpark of, I had, in, in my whole life, I'd been able to save about 400,000 bucks because I paid like eight, nine hundred dollars in rent and I worked 18 hours a day. And, went, and you put all 400 to those? All cars. of it. It's fucking crazy. It was crazy, but if you think about how big of a win it it's kind of like sports cards right now. So, like, this sports card thing is really funny. Like we I, just covered those auctions on trends, actually. I love that heritage auctions. Yes, growing uh, like crazy. Crazy, and if like LeBron rookies have gone up from a thousand, like like it's really funny. I think a lot of people think I'm talking about sports cards right now because I they know my narrative that I grew up with them, but I also try to remind my closest friends who are like calling me now and be like, yo, especially as they see the videos of like me in April saying buy LeBron at a thousand, now it's forty five hundred, you know, buy. Giannis for 180, now it's 1500, buy Luca for 35, now it's 280. Like now I've got like the receipts and it's happened within six months and everyone's like, wait a minute, is there something actually coming here? And I told my friends, I'm like, look, I've been passionate about sports cards since I was 11. I also haven't said a word about them for 20 years. So it's really happening. The reason I bring that up is this is one of the first things I've seen that is so unbelievably obvious to me that I did the same thing that I did with uh, investing, which is if it's 100%, not 99. If it's 99, I'm an immigrant and I'm gonna hold 50% back. But if it's 100, and you two, excuse me, Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr were 100% to me, and that became, that was right. So that crushed it. 
we sold an $84,000 campaign to a guy that I went to a basketball game with who was a wine library customer who invited me because he was a huge collector. And literally in the second quarter of this boring Nets game in the old stadium in Jersey, he goes, so what are you up to? I was like, actually, because I felt cold, I, I hadn't told anybody. I was like, actually my brother's about to it, it, uh, graduate in two months and I'm gonna start a business with him and I'm probably gonna spend, you know, I'm gonna, you know what I said, I know what I said to him, I'm like, I'm gonna be 150%. Don't worry, I'm gonna be 100% on Wine Library because he's my big customer, but I'm gonna put a lot of effort into building this company with my brother and he's like, and turns out that he was in marketing and he had this big campaign for Gillette starting around when, before AJ graduated. Our first campaign was before AJ graduated. It was like this, bullshit influencer Twitter campaign in Vegas for Gillette's razors and they paid us $84,000 which I thought was like a trillion especially compared to what we did. I tried to get them to do like 94 smart things. They're like, no, just take some photos here. I'm like, all right. Nonetheless, that 84,000 is the funding. That's pretty crazy to me because with our business, I mean, we haven't taken a lot of funding but I still am like, how close are we, are we, do we want to run, run our margins? And then, but you have to like put money up for rent, right? So in San Francisco, well, and here, you got to put, you know, your deposit. And well, it's and, funny, right? Like, you know, we have a lot of jobs we're putting out there at like, you know, forty and fifty, and people are like, "How can you live in New York?" They like yell at me, and I'm like, by not living in Manhattan, by not buying seven dollar Starbucks, by not taking Uber instead of the train, like, you could do anything, like, you know. To your point, you decide. You know, you were in a little bit of a different place. You were in that world. You made a couple hundred. You made some money on that exit. You were also in the cocoon of fun. You were in San Francisco cocoon. Yeah. Well, now most of our people are in Austin. Exactly. Like you know, you from mentality of St. Louis and Nashville, and you know you as the person that was living in a cocoon of San Francisco. Like, there's you can do anything if you're willing to not be entitled. If you're willing to be practical, this is this is where Americans get caught with immigrants all the time. How can how can this happen? Very easy. Like you live humbly as fuck, you save money, and you then deploy that money. It's not super complicated. You did it, I did it, my dad definitely did it, and like a billion fucking people have done it in America over the last hundred years. It's that people are impatient and insecure, um, and so the yeah, I mean that's how we did it. And like, so were you running? We didn't pay rent for the first two and a half years of the company. Were you guys running? You, so your bank, you guys are running on a, a slim bank balance even for a couple of years. Yes and no. We didn't pay rent again because I bartered. I asked, like you know, I already had a little street cred because of my wine business, so I was able to use me a little bit. So that's true. I just think that when you have like three hundred employees, it's like shit. Like it, yeah, but by that point, we had a, you know at three hundred employees, we were doing you know eighty-seven million dollars in revenue. Like you know at that point, you're balancing. But yeah, I mean. It's also not, you know what it comes down to, and I'm curious how you think about this, and I hope you've been able to hold on to this because it'll make you unstoppable. I'm also super, like I'm actually secretly excited about a headline in the New York Times that says VaynerMedia lays off half of its staff after the recession because if I made the wrong decisions of saving, which won't happen, but if I did, I'd still be okay with it. Here's why. I deserve it. I made the mistake. I like being accountable. I'm really into accountability. I really think it needs to get like super cool. Alex, do me a favor, text to, uh, Andy K right now and tell him I want it accountable as fuck. Hoodie made immediately, I want to wear it. See if he can get it to me this afternoon. Accountable as fuck. What, what in I, the same way, I apologize, I just want to say this. Like in the same way that I think kindness and empathy and patience needed to be a bigger part of the formula of entrepreneurship, which is why I've talked about it a lot more. I think accountability, like I, I just wish that every entrepreneur, back to your point, Razor thin margins. What does that mean? You can get caught. If you're okay with getting caught and paying the ramifications, you win. If you're not, as you know, and I've been listening to you on this interview, people creating exits in media land, creating exits that look like it's an exit. You know it wasn't an exit. They sold their assets for a penny on the dollar. But they wanted. They didn't have the guts to say we shut down, so they sold early, right? People are not willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to put my own cash back into VaynerMedia if I fucked up. I'm willing to have to let go of 10% of worst employees at Vayner if nine of our clients fire us. Like shit changes, things well, happen. I, I do these exercises and I tell Adam about it all the time. I just do these exercises all the time where I'm like, if this business goes out a business tomorrow, I'll be, fi- I'm gonna be, I'll be fine. You know why? Because you will be fine. Right, and so that's what I, and I do that exercise all the time because so I remember good. when we first started, I'm Love like, that. man, if this, oh my, my personality is so tied up in this. But then it, now it's like, 
if we go away tomorrow, I'll be just as happy. I would. And that kind of like when you protect your downside, that means you have no downside then, and it's only upside. And so that's kind of how we discuss it. I've said it a billion times, and I'll say it again. I want to lose everything, have everybody shit on me, say that I was a farce the whole time, see how everybody else was better than me, I was the joke, see, make fun of all the people that bought into me, all that, and then just rise back up and fucking tell everybody to go fuck themselves. Like, I'm into that shit. Yeah, I mean, it's really helpful. because it definitely, I think It's freeing. It's, it's unbelievably freeing. It's very freeing. What else is exciting for you to talk about? What else is on your mind? What else do you think will bring value to the people listening? What's been, what's been a, actually, let me ask you this way. What's been something that you feel your readers, which I'm sure overlap very heavily with this audience, and I'm sure plenty of them read already, have been really hot on? Uh, what's been, like, what do you guys put out? You're like, fuck, we knew it, and yeah, they really are hot on it. Well, I, I, I want to talk specific business things that, that we're, we're going over, so like different ideas and concepts, and I mean, I'm, I'm really bullish on um, a bunch of things. But first, one thing that we, get, we speak a lot about is focus. Um, and this is a little fluffy, so we don't spend too much time on it, but uh, when you get to a certain point, you have the ability to do a lot of different things. So I have invested in a ton of shit. So, but now I'm like, oh fuck, I gotta can't pay attention to that real estate deal. Can't pay attention to this. I really need to focus on only this thing and maybe one other thing. Um, what's your criteria for saying no and saying yes? Complete intuition every time. And when I say yes to things outside the core of Vayner X, I always treat it as it goes to zero, but I know that I need it because I need to get my entrepreneurial nut off. So, so what's that mean then? That means that I need to absolutely make that $50,000 investment or do that thing um, to make the whole machine work, AKA the 25% of things I'm doing that make no sense and stretch me too thin are actually the thing that gives me sanity and happiness, which allows the 75% of the Vayner focus to actually run at 150%. So Empathy Wines is one of them? Yes. And so that's your 25%? It's one of them. I mean, look, I, you know, I'm a funny guy. I talk, a lot, I, I talk a lot about a lot of things, and I don't talk about some of the best things about me, like who I am as a human in like the deep, like what Alex knows, not what you guys know. Uh, my nonprofits, I don't, and my, board work there, I don't talk about that. I also don't talk about my single biggest exit. I, I co-founded and co-created Resi, the restaurant app, like literally me and Ben Leventhal over dinner came up with the idea. I They were incubated at VaynerMedia uh, when the company was in a bad moment. I personally put money in. Uh, I spent a lot of social uh, capital getting uh, Danny Meyer and Steve Ross definitely deeply involved. I Ben and Mike Montero are absolutely the drivers of that business, but like I am easily the birth father and the third player in that story. It's a hefty nine-figure exit to Amex, and I have a funny feeling that 93% of the people that just heard this story heard it for the first time. Case was sold nine months ago. There is no confusion to why. I barely mentioned it. I just tweeted about it this week and everyone's like, oh, congrats. Uh, uh, so, I need those things to make me sane. They've also led to a ton of big wins. The Resi win covers every potential loss I have. Yeah, that's sold to Airbnb? It sold to, um, no, Airbnb was an investor though. It sold to Amex. American and it was Express. good? It was extremely good. Hefty nine figures. No shit? No shit. Wow. Congratulations. So, so you know, I think that um, I have to do a better job of like communicating some of those things too. Did you, we guys raise money for that? We did. We did. Um, first, from Vayner, Vayner RSC, my fund incubated it. So, so that was, you got a double win then. I got a double win. I got a triple win because I put personal money in when it needed it. So, but the reality is, is that. Um, I think when I hear you say that, I have a lot of empathy for you because I have a funny feeling we cross over in a lot of ways. I would tell you that don't overlook at it from a black and white standpoint, because to your point, I mean, there's so many things. You know, when you come from nothing, like when people email me and say, Gary, bad news, you know, really sorry, you know, but the investment you wrote into my company is going to zero, we're shutting down the doors, but don't worry, I learned a lot. I get pissed, I'm like, fuck you, motherfucker. Like, $50,000, $100,000 is a ton of money to me. Like, it doesn't matter how much I make, any, I earned that, I bled for that, I bled for that shit. So, you know, I think that, um, 
But I also would say to you on the flip side, I'm sure what you're realizing is some of those checks you wrote, you're gonna, you, when you wrote it, you imagined how much you were gonna help that thing to success and now you may never talk to that founder. Yeah. And I think that happened to me and the way I look at it now, A, I changed my behavior a little bit. B, what, what do you mean? What I stopped investing as much and would invest where I thought by accident I could help. Just by maybe, you know, when you build a brand too, your name can help. I have absolutely invested when I believed in something and believed in the person and knew that my investment would help them raise more money. So I've thought a lot about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, think it, I think all those micro losses is why I'm gonna macro win. I need it. I'm an artist. I'm creative by nature. I need it. So you want to talk about some interesting things that we've been going over on, Please. on in the hustle and on trends that I think you'll enjoy riffing on. Please. Okay, so you guys, uh, Vayner had a real estate conference, right? Yes. How'd that go? Financially. Financially, it went well. Where where it was vulnerable was the- I heard you said something stupid too. You got in trouble. No, I didn't get to say anything stupid. I still believe in it. I said that- Sorry, I, you know, I don't mean stupid. I mean You didn't hurt my feelings. I know what you meant. Um, three things. One, right, so to your point, on that, one, it was age of 2021, it was run 100% by Kim Garcia. I always knew that Kim might not stay long term, and so there was, the the vulnerability was, unlike anything else I do at VaynerMedia, there was no backup to Kim going on in her career, which is why we didn't do it this year. Uh, as far as the backlash, I st- I'll triple down on it right now. Which I agree with you. I, I... A stunning amount of people overextend themselves on their first house purchase just to say they bought a home. Everybody almost maximizes their down payment, which eliminates cash flow. Uh, Almost everybody buys a home that's too big for them and has an extra bedroom or living room that they never use. And I think for people that are entrepreneurial and are trying to grow happiness and business capabilities, that they need to rethink their buying home strategy and lean into more renting so that they have the liquid to go on the offense so they can then buy a home at 39 or 57 or never. So I believe in that. And then so the industry took that as, you know, Gary says never buy a home. and. I love that. My sister's a real estate agent. I thought it, I still I believe in a triple. And when I tell you, I give no fucks to the backlash of people that have financial vested interest in people buying homes for themselves, not having empathy for the person that buys the home, then go fuck themselves. So this next conference of yours sounds like it's going to go great. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the, com- the conference is easy, right? Like the conference like is is easy. But that was for- a good business for you guys. It was an okay business. We made we made six figures on both executions through sponsorships and ticket sales. I lo- I love the events business. Yeah, so let's talk about it. So, so I did a big case study. I, I studied uh, the top five companies. You know, there's a company called Informa. You know Informa? I do. I love Informa. It's a fifteen billion dollar market cap. Their their uh, margins are sig- significantly larger than a lot of these huge tech companies uh, like Atlassian and things like that. Who I compare them to. Um, I mean, they could do three or four billion dollars a year in trade show revenue with like a forty percent net income margin. Fat, and specifically, I think there. But in, and and there's some lacking in the construction uh, field um, and a few other industries. But I, I love the trade show industry. I love it. I think it, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, what were you, and what were you saying about why you love them? Uh, because they're highly profitable and humans will continue to interact and everyone's attention is on scalable tech, not humanity and non-scalable shit like that. And at scale, you can you can really do damage. Yeah, but a lot of people don't realize it um, because it seems kind of unsexy, it's not interesting. Well, that's it. That's, I mean, bro, every single one of my friends made fun of me for starting VaynerMedia. It's a client service business. They didn't, real, they didn't, and I, to your point, back to like why I would never judge somebody that wants to do a hundo in 2025, you know how you navigate by being a runner, that gives me a lot of insight. Actually gives me a lot of insight on me. I never compete with myself. I don't run or whatever. Though I was pumped, I did break my jumping, uh, my jump rope record uh, this Saturday, Sunday with Mike on how many I can do in 12 minutes. But nonetheless, I would tell you that non-sexy businesses right now that have true business fundamentals are by far the most interesting thing. What else is more interesting then? Sports cards, I'm sorry to bring it up again. All my friends are like, this is stupid, it's all gonna go tech. I'm like, cool, I really don't think so. Like physical things are not going away okay, from our society. How, so then what, where are the opportunities? Through uh, exchange, uh, marketplaces? 
Yeah, somebody's gonna build a true, you know, there's something called ComC, there's a company running around right now raising capital, that's a true Merkle exchange type thing where you never take any of the cards, you short, you, you, you buy futures. Yes, I also think sports like music is a fundamental pillar, like I love history. The Romans, biggest events were people fucking fighting each other, like boxing and fighting a lion and whatever the fuck, but like this is never going away and I think that if you look at culture, look at, look at all of us right now. There's a lot of young professionals in this room. I'm gonna call myself young. The way we're dressed, like every person here doing the same thing we're doing right now in 1974 looks totally different. The casual nature, the culture nature, and I think art is f- not this generation's favorite thing, though there's cool art and there's a lot of fun things and I'm actually in an art business I like a lot called Iconic, but yeah, I- Yeah, the, the posters. Uh-huh, I'm a very big fan that because of sneaker culture and because of urban culture, that I think that sports cards are about to become the next art. And so like a lot of what I'm buying, whether it's Colin Kaepernick, which is cultural, not what he can do on the field because he's probably not gonna be on the field again, or, or basketball, soccer, wrestling cards. Like I think they're the next art. What's I, another place, another way you'd attack that market? Um, shovels and picks. Right, because I'm just tra- you know back to the way you asked that question. The more thoughtful business, the one that I have less interest in, but where the bigger economics are is the infrastructure around it. Uh, let's just parlay our two conversations. The core event is called the National. It's the biggest sports card show. How big is it? I don't know. You know who owns it? I do not. Um, but I can tell you since I've been to the last two, it's it's great and it's part of the hobby's tradition, but there's clearly opportunity, and I don't know on the comp of Comic-Con if the people that originally owned it then just became what it became today. I would love that for the family that's been in it on the national, but either them or a competitor coming in clearly has an opportunity to create an events business that is going to matter because you can see the energy, like regional shows are so mom and pop. I mean, it's exactly what you think they look like, but there's a place for it to go pop culture. Um, there's grading companies. The whole industry is built on the That's grading. That's badass. I would, are, go, I would go in that you, route. You know, that PSA is a publicly traded company that uh, I think the stock has done well recently. There's right starting there. the IP company. They're starting the next brand, Upper Deck, Tops, Fleer. PSA? PSA is the grading company. There's three good grading. There's three leaders in grading. SGC, is PSA. Like a Moody's? What's a Moody's? Uh, for stocks. I don't know. What's a Moody's? Moody's. Um, what's another? The baseline. They, like they, 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 they give you like the, the A, triple A rating. I, the ratings company. Yeah, this is, a, this is a little bit more flawed. It's human. It's like appraisal on how good the card. There's a lot of uh, anxiety of this business because there's people that try to trim cards or alter cards. Authenticity. Like it's humans grading. That's awesome. I like that business. Um, there's being an IP company. Right now, Panini and Tops own all the rights. But... You could start a new company or buy one of the old brands and then get the rights from the NBA or the or the MLB. So there's the IP renting company, kind of like ESPN and and Fox get the rights for the leagues. That's how sports cards work. There's the expansion. I've been thinking a lot about creating hip hop cards. Like you know what would happen if you went into a new arena and created cards. Uh, Pokemon and Magic the Gathering haven't even started the process of, they're already ridiculously expensive, but that age group is younger. That was the 90s generation cards, whereas the 80s was sports. So there's non-sports cards. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of variables. So I'm gonna have our analysts and our team go and, I love and it. write that up. Please, and I'll give a ton of exposure. If, uh, from, I've heard from a lot of people the quality of your guys' work is really good. So if you're gonna go really deep and do it, I know it on surface level intuition and like little parts, but like some of the data, like I don't know if there's been a single better thing to invest in in the last year than sports cards, including crypto. Anything good that has happened in crypto, cannabis, stock, like we're talking about 20, 30, 40X return in six and nine months. Liquid. Like one thing that you know that sucks about angel investing is you're locked. Yeah, for eight years, 10 years. Right, I mean, you bought, a, you know, I bought 53 of them. I, I wish I bought 500 of them. You buy 53 LeBrons last spring, I'm talking eight months ago, for 1,000, they're fucking 4,500 right now and and there's demand. The reason Are they got, young people buying it or older? Everybody, it's just happening. I'll tell you who's buying. My generation that now has wealth that's going back to their childhood, nostalgia, always works. They're eight-year-olds, so the kids of the core group, gamblers, 
the amount of gambling culture in sports is heavy, daily fantasy, actual betting, prop betting, you've seen all that explosion, well guess what? Like if you know sports, another way to gamble is to put it into players you believe in. Uh, and then sneaker flipper kids. The, in- the enormity of that industry that has been massively disrupted by StockX and IPOs, you can't go to the sneaker store anymore and hire 80 of your high school friends to stand in line, get the Yeezys, bring them back, give them 10 bucks each, and then go make real money. That's, yeah, that's wild. I've enjoyed watching that thing. Um, what's another industry that uh, has been exciting you? One, one that, I, that I'm DTC in. brands that are not VC backed. Slow and steady, I'm gonna build a $39 million t-shirt business, gum business, honey business, but I'm not gonna do it like Casper. Or and, Outdoor Voices, you Correct, see that? I didn't see it yet. Uh, the CEO had a step down, I don't know if it's fire step down. Okay. How much did they? How much did they raise? Do you know? Yeah, they raised uh, I don't know, like forty or fifty million dollars. So this, million this they raised fifty million dollars or something. The revenue was only forty nine, and they are losing two million dollars a month. I've got a friend that has a ra- a business that sells dog ramps that does three million a month in revenue with nothing. I mean, it's crazy how Brother, much. Brother, this is the whole theme of this whole conversation. It's why I pressed early on. The more we don't become like it, the more likely we're going to be super all right. Hot dog you is the best version of you. Yeah. And I think that that is what we're on the dawn of. I think a lot of what I'm talking about, do you know what's, do you understand the utter carnage on an, if this coronavirus thing continues its momentum, let, let there be no confusion. I don't know when we're airing this, I assume this week, next week, so it's not gonna be too far, but like, as of this morning, the mo- Spain was, sh- people is in Spain are being shut, or Milan are being shut down. I'm, again, I'm headline reading, so I'm talking out of my ass and not out of my ass. I just had a breakfast, I look up, all red, CNBC, coronavirus. I had a friend hit me up over the weekend saying like, hey, this in America, this is a little bit weirder than you think. This is who my uncle is. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Wait, wait, like, what's that mean? Just said, hey, this is more serious in America than you think, and you'll be finding out in the next 100 days. Oh, because they're And I'm not a big new. conspiracy theorist, so putting that out there, I hope I scared nobody, but like, I'm just sharing. like. Where I'm going is, whether it's fucking coronavirus or the inevitable economic downturn, nobody's building real businesses anymore. You know that. All of Silicon Valley in New York, to your point, nobody's building actual businesses. Yeah, I think it's crazy that these people raise money for some of these D2C brands. It's crazy. It's because they can. There's so much money in the system. Yeah. There's too much money in the system. And they don't realize that they'll get way richer by not doing that. They just, they, they like the perception of success versus actual success. Because it's actually incredibly cheap to do this. The perception, it also, brother, I'll tell you this though. It's time we talk about entrepreneurship and talent. You and I got lucky in the fucking DNA game. It is not so easy. Like, to, it, I understand what you're saying and I say it too, let's flip it around. It's actually super hard to build a sustainable business where you're not being fucking trust funded. All these startups are trust funds. When I always tell people, I'm like, intellectually, it's not that hard. Emotionally, it's it's super challenging, and a lot Life. of people and, and they can't just balance. You get, Good I'm news, like, nothing's complicated intellectually. This is all emotion. People right. people don't have the stomach for losing and judgment. Yeah, I mean, starting these DSC brands, like I know a bunch of people doing. I'm like, this is really not that You'll hard. Appreciate you appreciate this. Gotta be able to, you got to be able to stay ready? balanced. What's more fun for 99 percent of the people listening and the world right now? Hey, go raise money and look like you're killing it and have CEO in your Instagram title and have money to go spend because you're paying yourself enough and all this stuff or eat dog shit for four and a half years to build a foundation to maybe get to that same exact place but you're on stable ground and then you can start the process and maybe in eight years it can look good. The end. Who the fuck is gonna pick eight years over eight minutes? One percent, which is why that one percent's about to win big. Is there anything else you like? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole uh, psychedelic thing. Oh, that's so obvious to me. Like the whole Aubrey and Ferris and all that circles. I'm yeah. huge on it. Men's makeup. Men's makeup, what? Men's makeup. You, can you write that down? Me, I know we're wrapping, I know everyone's trying to get us to wrap up, we're having too much fun. I got a real hot take. Not short term, sports cards short term. Um, Wait, talk about psychedelics though. What I can tell is that this, psychedelics are only repressed because of stigma, them? no. I mean, I don't even, I don't drink, I don't, I don't I've do never even smoked a cigarette. Like, I'm uh, yeah. super weird, but, yeah, I drink wine. Um, but I've been drunk like five times. I'm, co- I'm completely sober, and yeah. I love that, but I still love that thing. Yeah, me too, because I don't have feelings and opinions when it comes to business. Would you do them? 
I probably wouldn't because my mom Nancy Reagan me out too much. It's a framework for me. But I will say this, I'll never say never. Like, I'm willing to do whatever the fuck I need to do at any point. It's just not in my framework. On the flip side, on, I'm also way too grateful and thankful of my mental happiness and I would be lying if I didn't tell you that I'd be scared to alter something or you know, a lot of people do it because it finds a dimension that works for them. I'm like my current state is working for me. I don't want to open up something and be like, oh fuck. Yeah, and they're like, broke. you know, yeah, like like don't fix yeah, to, but if I wasn't mentally happy, I'm open for everything. Everything's in play. Have you heard of MDMA therapy? No. I think it's it's awesome. Tucker Tucker Max has told he's one of our investors. Yep. He's he because t- I go to therapy and I used to take antidepressants. He was like, dude, do this. I've been on this medication for years and I did this thing. I feel way better. Anything that helps people get off medication is something intuitively in my gut. Not I'm not a doctor. I don't know. Like I'm sure there's plenty of medicines that matter, um, but I'm always pumped knowing enough about the business of pharma in America. I'm always pumped if people can find a different way. But back to psychedelics. Uh, and like and uh, sexual experimentation, like what you're seeing right now, is a mature, practical version of what you saw in the '60s. And I think it's a game of stigma. What's an example of uh, what's an example? Well, there? I think you know when I think about my friends in Silicon Valley who talk about you know psychedelics and things of that nature, inevitably in that same dinner, it gets into alternative sexual relationships and so like an open like open marriages in a more progressive way than open marriages or that's, like I would never I don't think I could ever do that that's, yeah, it's not that, for me either but like what but I don't like imposing my like what I think makes me successful in these talks is I never impose my will or opinion on what will happen sure. all my friends that are like fuck how did you I got TikTok wrong it's like and whether TikTok disappears tomorrow or not there's incredible money being made in the TikTok infrastructure and that's what we're talking about business in this narrow way and I'm they're like why are you always right I'm like because I don't impose my opinion you're, because I'm talking to these inner circle friends, I'm like, you said it was stupid for you. You said that because you're insecure. You have 800,000 followers on Instagram and you don't want to start over. You're doing what Tila Tequila and Dane Cook did with MySpace. You're doing what all my homies on Twitter did about Instagram. You now are doing that to Instagram. You're so set in your thing and you've got clout. You don't want the world to reset. I only want the world to reset because I don't actually value my clout. I value learnings and impact. It's a huge deal. So well, psychedelics, real quick to finish this off and then jump in with your, your helps. Psychedelic stigma is gonna go away, which is then gonna make people feel comfortable to do it. And I have a very deep intuitive feeling that it is the medicine, or whatever the fuck you wanna call it, that's gonna help a fuckload of people who have not been able to find their alternative in Advil or in therapy or in much harder core medicine. And that excites the shit out of me. I want way more happiness in the world. Um, do we have time for one more or no? Go ahead, go ahead. Is there anything else that's exciting you? DTC, sports cards, um, live, li- it's funny, we've talked about it. Live events, DTC, and sports cards. Practical DTC, because it's there, but you can't take funding, 10 years, not 10 minutes. Sports cards, I'm obsessed. Uh, live events, I'm obsessed. For, for the DTC, is there any particular products you're, you're fascinated, or Everything's, categories? Ev- every single thing that's sold in a store is vulnerable to DTC. What I like to do is just look at Procter & Gamble, everything they sell, you just throw a dart at it. Every, better than that, and I like what you did because Procter's the leader, but like, take it all. Anything that's sold in a store Just is, Target, just walk around Target. Anything. Yeah. And that then tells every entrepreneur, because I know a lot are listening right now, sell what you love. Like if you love blueberry jam, fucking make that brand. Back to you saying it's easy, it has never been easier to be like, I love peanut butter and jelly, for real. For real, I love it. It's never been easier on earth. And I mean, the delta is like a billion to zero on starting a peanut butter and jelly brand if you take a 10 year window. If you take a 10 year window, let me tell you real life instead of this VC shit. And I know we're late, but fuck it, I'm pumped right now. If you sell dumb shit in your house, I don't have money, Gary, good. You have stuff in your house. You're no, like Most Americans have stuff. Even like people that aren't making a lot of money have fucking stuff. At least a thousand dollars of crap. Yes, and if you don't, I'll teach you, and I keep teaching people, I'll teach you how to take 30 bucks and turn it into 1,000. I fucking did in Trash Talk episode three. It was called $20 of Olympic pins for over 1,000. Real life, real talk. Do you have the humility to go garage sailing? That's the question. Do you have humility to go to the dollar store and walk out and while everybody is at that Whole Foods and sees you walking out with bags from the dollar store? People don't like judgment. Do you have the humility when you don't have a car to go pick up something on Craigslist and take the fucking bus and sit with a lamp on your lap? Like, well, why so, wouldn't you want to do that? That sounds fun. Because it's easier 
for people mentally to complain and blame than to take on accountability. Accountable as fuck, tell them I want it this afternoon, Alex. So nonetheless, if you can get 20,000 bucks by eating shit for a year and grinding, then you can then take that $20,000 to develop early stage peanut butter and jelly brand, early stage Instagram and TikTok ads, and early stage, early stage, early stage, AKA 10 years. But in 10 years, if you're 32, could you imagine being able to quit your job at 42 that you fucking hate and are dying inside and do a business around your singular thing, your singular thing. I'm talking, everybody needs to hear this. This is Crush It 2008. I was right, it's real. Like, people are still not doing it. Fuck where you see the opportunity because you read the hustle and, and trends and you're like, fuck, there's not, that's great. And by the way, you might be like me. By the way, me, I'm a business nerd. I can get fired up about anything. Yeah, we just like to nerd out right. on that stuff. But if you're fucking hardcore, toothpaste like you like like it you like buy different brands you're intrigued by it it's vulnerable if you're like hardcore skiing like you, like and video work like go become the person that fucking does content on ski mountains it's real it's fucking real but you have to think of it in 10 years because anybody who thinks it's real thinks you have to raise money everybody thinks you have to raise money now it's fucking broke, bro. It's never been cheaper. Maybe if you live in San Francisco, but I always tell people, I go go to move to so New don't, Mexico. So don't live in fucking San Francisco. You go then. to New Mexico. Yeah. Go to Missouri. That's right, bro. <laughs> no, for real. Whenever I when BuzzFeed and Vox were doing their thing, I was tweeting. I was like, move your offices to St. Louis. <laughs> You'll true. be profitable. Anyway, bro. Uh, I really, I really um, appreciate being on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, we have um, the hustle and trends and all that, but we also have this cool podcast that. We're, I was talking to your guy. We're going to be close and beating you in the numbers. That's my goal. Makes me happy. No, I'm just Honestly, giving you a hard time. No, I'm not on a hard time. On some real shit, you know, to, to the gr- Kobe Bryant was the most competitive, iconic figure in our culture. And when he tweeted a congrat- his last tweet, couldn't be more symbol- symbolic. LeBron. That's right. And that's who, like, that's who I am. Nothing makes me happier than when entrepreneurs on merit outwork out succeed me, because that's the game. Either you love the game or you don't. So the, the, these last five minutes when we were just riffing on interesting opportunities, what we do is we just research all of them and we just riff on them and we have experts come in sometimes. It's called My First Million. If, you ever wanna, if you're in San Francisco and ever want to come on it, like I said, well, similar reaches this. Happy to this, figure it out. Come and do it. I'm happy to do it. Thanks, Thanks for, for being having on. me.